Back in April, lots of ETF investors lost money in oil ETFs, specifically in the United States Oil Fund, the USO. In this video, we're going to explore exactly what happened so that we can gain an understanding and make sure the same doesn't happen to you and your ETFs going forward. But what exactly happened then back in April? The largest oil fund in the world, the United States Oil Fund with the ticker symbol USO, had over $4.5 billion in assets. Then they completely imploded, losing 75% of their value since January alone. This was a direct consequence of the oil price crashing. WTI, the Western Texas Intermediate, is the type of oil produced in the United States and is a key indicator for the price of crude oil. WTI crashed from its 2020 high of just over $63 to a minus figure of negative 36 back in April. There was just way too much supply to meet that of demand. But first, before we get into why the oil price crashed, we need to do some housekeeping. We need to explain exactly what futures contracts are, and we need to explain how the USO fund works. I'm going to be referring to the different funds as exchange traded products. The reason being is that it's just an umbrella term which covers exchange traded funds, ETFs, exchange traded notes, ETNs, and exchange traded commodities, ETCs. ETNs are basically the cousin of the ETF, but where you don't have a claim to the underlying investment. I'm just going to be using the term ETPs, Exchange Traded Products, just to cut back on all of those horrible acronyms and try and make the video as understandable as possible. But of course, if you are interested, I do encourage you to read up and figure out exactly what the differences are between ETCs, ETFs and ETNs. Now that's out of the way, we can start talking about futures and how the USO fund works. But what exactly is a futures contract? Well, the good news is it's not an acronym and it sounds like what it actually is. A futures contract is just an agreement between a buyer and a seller to purchase certain commodities by a certain date. So for example, if I was a large fund, say Michael's Oil Fund, then I could agree with an oil producer like BP to purchase 100 barrels of oil for £10 per barrel by July the 31st. Now, this is great if the price of oil goes up between now and then. If the price of oil goes up to £20 per barrel, I can still purchase the oil for £10 per barrel, as that's what I agreed in the contract. So once the oil prices hit a certain threshold, let's say £20 per barrel for our hypothetical situation, then I would sell the contract to somebody else who actually wanted the oil. After all, I really don't want the oil. I have no facilities to take the oil. I'm just looking to make some money from the price fluctuations in the oil in the short term. I could sell the oil futures contract to somebody such as the owner of Pete's petrol station who'd be happy to purchase a contract as he would get the oil at a cheaper price than the market price. And I'd make a healthy profit in the process. I would buy more contracts which expire in the next couple of months. I effectively roll over my contracts by selling the old ones at a profit and then I can buy more contracts. Now this is a great way of making money as it means that I don't actually have to own the oil, I don't need to store it and I don't have the costs associated with that. This is exactly what USO is doing. When the oil prices are going up, we're in what we call a stage of backwardation. It sounds complicated, but it's really not. It just means that the price of oil is increasing and then we can sell our oil contracts as they approach their expiration date. And we can make a nice profit in the process. But what happens, say, if a global pandemic forces every country into lockdown and demand for oil plummets? Well, we enter into something called Contango. This means that Michael's Oil Fund, who has agreed to purchase 100 barrels for £10, is in a spot of bother when the price of oil decreases to £5 per barrel. Now, I can't sell my oil contract to Pete's petrol station, because why would he buy the oil for £10 per barrel when he can buy it for just £5 in the wider market? So I have a problem, because my contract expires soon and I have to purchase the oil because I signed the contract. This is a key difference between futures and options. So what do I do? I can either buy the oil and then have to try and figure out some way of transporting the oil and storing it, and I'm sure that's going to be incredibly costly, and that's not even to mention then I've got to later try and find a buyer for it when the price might decrease even more. Or I go to Pete at the petrol station and say, hey Pete, do you want to buy this oil from me at a reduced price? Or I might even pay him in the worst case scenario to take the oil off me, because paying him will be less cost to me than the cost of storing the oil. 
So I sell my contracts at a loss and then I then go on to purchase more oil futures because one, I think the oil price is going to increase and two, because it's just what I do. I'm a fund who invests in short term oil futures. So this is great, but I can't actually buy as many contracts as I had before because I've lost money in the process. This is known as the rollover cost. Now, this is an incredibly simplified version, but it is exactly what USO is doing. A lot of the individual investors that were piling into the USO either didn't understand this, understood this but didn't quite grasp the consequences of this, or understood everything but presumed that oil was going to make a spectacular and a sudden recovery. This means that it would enter back into a stage of backwardation and the fund would start making money again. So now we know what happened, we need to understand why it happened and why the effects were so large so that you can invest your money more confidently in ETFs without having this in the back of your mind. Before the coronavirus crisis, we were in the longest bull market in history, starting out the lows of 2009 after the global financial crisis and using the S&P 500 as an indicator, we can see that the price of the index rose from 676 to its all time high of 3300 in February 2020. Through this time, investors became conditioned to buying the dips and always seeing an immediate and effective recovery from the corrections. Retail investors became conditioned like Pavlov's dog and became used to buying the dip for a nice gain. But when coronavirus hit, we saw something totally different to what we're used to. When coronavirus took hold, nations across the world went into lockdown, which stifled demand for oil as the transport sector shut down. Planes remained grounded, ships remained in port, and we stopped commuting. This led to an oversupply of oil, but why don't we just lower the supply of oil? Why don't we just stop producing as much oil to match that of demand? Well, the answer lies within something called the tragedy of the commons. That is, since everybody acts in their own best interest rather than the interest of the group, then it means that everybody's taking more than their fair share. Eventually, this just kind of ruins it for everybody and it means that there's no share to take in the end. If you have different oil providers that say oil provider A, B and C, the smart thing to do would be to reduce production from all three by 50%. But would producer A reduce their consumption by 50% if they knew that B and C was going to remain at 100%? No, it makes no sense to. And that is exactly why the oil price crashed. Because they can all make an agreement, all three remained at 100% production, and this meant that there was an oversupply of oil. Eventually, the main oil producers did agree and cut down on production. But many argue it was too little too late, as all the oil storage facilities were already nearing their capacity. There just wasn't enough places to store the oil. Tons of retail investors were attracted to the low crude oil futures prices and so swarmed into the ETP, believing that it's going to give them exposure to the inevitable rebound in oil prices, just like it had done time and time before. But many investors got this wrong, really wrong, as the price continued to plummet. For example, the week before the WTI went negative for the first time in history, investors piled $1.6 billion into the ETP USO. As oil prices continued to fall, the futures contracts neared and hit their expiration dates, as there were just no buyers for the contracts. Those that held futures contracts, including the USO fund, were forced to accept negative settlements at around minus $37 in order to avoid having to take physical delivery of the oil. The expiration dates of the futures contracts meant that the USO was selling the contracts at a loss, and so they could purchase less and less contracts. As the losses increased, the price of the USO fund continued to crash. If the price of the oil decreased but then quickly recovered, then the fund wouldn't lose any money. So long as the oil price recovers before the expiration date, it still means that the fund can make money from the oil. But since the market was in a state of contango and the oil price was decreasing, it means that the short-term contracts which the USO fund owns were expiring and they were forced to sell the contracts at a loss or take ownership of the oil, which they clearly didn't want to do. Professional investors with exposure to commodities could see this coming, they could see the risks. They understood exactly what backwardation and contango was, and they could pull their money out of the fund before things got nasty. This means that they could invest elsewhere or invest in funds with longer expiration dates on their futures contracts. Private individuals didn't quite have this luxury as they didn't fully understand what the USO fund was investing their money into. 
they were banking on a long-term recovery of the oil price, which of course makes sense. When oil is at that rock bottom low, of course oil is going to recover at some point in the long term. But this doesn't matter in the long term when you're investing in short-term contracts. The expiration dates are so soon that it only matters what's happening to oil in the next month or two. During this whole process, short sellers went manic. It was like Christmas for them. They tripled the amount of shares they were shorting by adding an extra 46 million shorted shares. The fund managers at USO scrambled to save the fund. They executed what is known as a one for eight reverse split. This increases the net asset value per share, but decreases the amount of shares outstanding. It's where USO basically turned every eight shares into just one share, which boosts the share price. They don't create any real value doing this, they just boost the share price to curtail the downward pressures and ensure that the price doesn't drop below the threshold which would see it delisted from some exchanges. So the fund was doing what they could to make sure that the fund doesn't go under. But the good thing for you as an individual investor is that if you don't buy the futures directly, but you buy them by investing in the ETF like this one, then you are classed as a passive holder and so can't be asked for collateral to cover the negative costs. The fund can, however, be liquidated and this would mean that you lose 100% of your investment, a terrible outcome, but you're not liable for anything above this. This was a very real possibility for USO and bears striking resemblance to XIV, the volatility ETP that was dissolved back in 2018. Although now it's looking increasingly unlikely that the USO goes under as the oil market is slowly starting to pick back up. But the fund managers at USO really can't catch a break. They're now facing a whole bunch of class action lawsuits against the fund. If you bought into the fund between the 19th of March and the 28th of April, you might be able to recover some of your losses. I'll leave a link in the description below to who you should contact if that's the case. So what can we do going forward to make sure the same doesn't happen again and make sure that your money and your ETFs are safe? Firstly, are you sure that you want to invest in oil? Oil does run the world at the moment, there's no denying it. But the long-term prospect of oil doesn't look great when we're looking to transition to a greener world. So the USO fund and disasters like that will hopefully increase this disinvestment away from oil into greener alternatives. But if you're dead set on investing in oil, then you could invest in the oil companies. Oil and gas ETFs give you exposure to large oil companies which benefit from the increases in oil price. An oil and gas company ETF you might consider is the X-Tracker Stocks Europe 600 Oil and Gas ETF, which tracks the largest 600 oil and gas companies in Western Europe, with an expense ratio of just 0.3% per year. These ETPs don't see the volatility like the ETFs which track commodities using futures. And although this is a good thing for a lot of us, it means that short-term increases in the price of oil are not realised to the same extent. If you do want to invest in futures contracts for oil, then the ETPs such as USO are taking measures to ensure that they're not so reliant on short-term contracts, which are of course susceptible to short-term falls in demand. On the 21st of April, the USO fund switched some of its holdings to longer dated futures contracts. There is an old Turkish proverb, however, that says something like, if your mouth is burned by milk, you blow before you eat yogurt. Be careful with these ETPs and make sure you fully understand how they work first. There are also alternatives to USO, such as the United States 12-month oil fund, USL. Like the USO, the fund trades on futures contracts and also looks to track the price of the WTI. A crucial difference is that the USL invests in a 12-month strip of oil futures contracts. That means that at any given point, there's only a twelfth of the fund invested in that month's futures contracts. This is by no means perfect though, and there are still risks involved. You need to do your homework before investing in funds like this. But if you are dead set on investing in oil funds, then this is a better alternative than USO in my opinion. This video is about oil ETPs, but what about other funds which invest in short-term futures contracts for different commodities, but face the same risks as USO? Coronavirus saw a huge decrease in oil demand, but could future disasters see a similar decrease in coffee, sugar and tea? Even gold? If it does, then ETPs such as the IPATH Coffee Sub-Index could be at risk as it tracks the price of coffee in exactly the same way that the USO tracks the price of oil, using short-term futures contracts. Like most things in life, these ETPs work perfectly well until they don't. 
So if you want exposure to these commodities, but you want to play it a bit more safe, then you can invest only in funds which purchase the physical commodities. For example, if you're looking to invest in gold, you could invest in the iShares Physical Gold ETC with the ticker symbol SGLN. The expense ratio is 0.19% per year, which is slightly higher, but in my opinion, this is definitely worth the money because they physically hold the gold. So it's a lot more safe and it just gives you that peace of mind just knowing that they're actually holding a physical commodity and not just futures contracts. The falling price of oil burnt a lot of individual investors, excuse the pun, who perhaps wasn't as aware as they could have been about how futures work and how the USO fund invests their money. I do this as well sometimes, I jump into things without laying down the necessary groundwork to fully understand it before I commit. The USO disaster awakened a lot of people to the dangers of not fully understanding your investment vehicle. Hopefully this will be a good thing as people like me and you spend some more time researching our investments and trying to fully understand what we're investing into. I hope you liked the video, I post every week and I try to alternate between ETF reviews where I weigh up the pros and cons of the ETF and deep dives into subject matters like this one that we did today. Have a look around if you might find them interesting.